Good morning, everybody. So I guess my job is to ask you how you're feeling. Um, you think I might be kidding. Um, so I want to thank Lonnie and the whole team for inviting me out here. And uh, I think I'm just going to jump right in. We've got about an hour, is that right? And then uh, take some Q&A and then you'll be ready to take over the world with one feeling at a time. So let me ask everyone to please get good posture if you don't mind. Like sit up straight in your seats. You look a lot better that way, just so that you know. Um, you breathe better too. Um, although I have no research to support that, it's still a good thing to do. And let me ask you all to just bring yourselves into the room. And I'm going to start off with a quote. It's one that you may have seen before. And it's by Roosevelt. And it says, no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. So can I ask you to just take a moment and reflect on that for a moment? How does that quote resonate with you? What comes to mind? Who comes to mind? Because I want to keep this a little interactive today, I'm going to ask you to take about 30 seconds and just turn to someone next to you. If you're sitting alone, you could pretend you have multiple personality disorders <laughs> or dissociation. Um, we try to find someone near you. 30 seconds. First thing that came to mind. Go ahead. Can everybody put a hand in the air? Thank you. That's going to be our little signal for coming back together. So given you know, I'm so far away from the audience today, I won't get too much um, from you in, in terms of this reflection. But I want to share with you why this quote means a lot to me um, for a variety of reasons. One is I work at an institution that is not known for feeling. Um, it's known for cognition, right? Everybody's got to have high SAT scores. And I always tell my students that every one of them had higher SAT scores than I had to get into Yale because I was a terrible student. I had very low SAT scores. I had terrible anxiety around testing. And I had some horrific experiences in my childhood that just made it very hard for me to focus. Um, the second thing is that I get a lot of resistance in my courses. So I teach a course called Emotional Intelligence. And lots of people sign up for hundreds of hundreds of people. And then they think they're coming there to, mem to remember things like the date that the first theory was published, or the correlation coefficient between emotional intelligence and life satisfaction, you know, the 0.33, which truthfully I cannot remember myself. And I wrote those papers. <laughs> and so my my wish for my students to memorize the correlation coefficient between two variables is like negative zero. Um, but when I'm asking them to take time to reflect on their feelings as students, um, to journal about them, all of a sudden there's a lot of pushback. Things like this, Professor Brackett, I didn't need emotional intelligence to get into Yale. <laughs> this is what they literally say to me. And I say, well, you're going to need it to get out. Um, <laughs> And I mean that seriously, because like, honestly, you're not really you know, someone who I'd like to hire. Um, <laughs> and maybe you should get some social skills training while you're here, too. <laughs> but um, and I, you know, I can get in trouble for saying this. I'm being filmed right now. I'm like, there goes my career. Uh, but um, another example is uh, all of a lot of you here are clinicians working with patients and clients. Um, so at Yale, I was, I'm in the medical school and I was asked to do quite a lot of training for physicians and nurses. And I just want to share with you, you know, where we're at as a nation, even in the medical field. So I do this, what I believe is a very heartfelt, good presentation to a major department in the medical school, hundred or so physicians. Um, at the end of my presentation, I just open it up for questions and I say something like, any questions? Our, our thoughts. And one veteran professor stands up. He looks at me like an eagle might look at a squirrel. Uh, and the first thing that comes out of his mouth is the following. What happened to Yale? <laughs> now, I couldn't believe that. I was like, Mark, take your breath. Use your strategies. Uh, <laughs> and then he said to me, he said, Mark, this is Yale. We produce Nobel laureates, not nice people. I honestly couldn't believe this is happening. 
I do have some training in like group facilitation. So I said, does anyone else have another perspective? <laughs> um, lo and behold, another freaking doctor stands up and he looks at me and he goes, here's what I learned, Mark. Excuse my language on this one. Sometimes you just have to be an asshole because then the people who work for you just shut up and do what you tell them to do. Now at that point, I'm like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> so I look over at the chair of this department and I'm like, are we making a documentary here or something? <laughs> like, are you testing my emotional intelligence or something? And literally the chair of the department looks at me and he goes, why do you think I asked you to come in? <laughs> and so as much as we have made progress in the world around social and emotional learning, as much as we have made progress in writing tons of articles and publishing books on this topic of emotional intelligence, we've got a lot of work to do. And it's part of the reason why I wrote this book called Permission to Feel, because I've been frustrated as a psychologist, as a running around the world kind of guy trying to get people to talk about their feelings. And you can imagine, back in 1990, the first theory of emotional intelligence was published. It was published by my mentors. And um, that was 30 years ago. 25 years ago, you probably heard of a book called Emotional Intelligence written by Daniel Goleman. It was a big pop selling, you know, best selling book. That's 25 years in our culture. Um, the field of social and emotional learning here in Chicago, right? you can't, you, it's, it's based here, you know, with the Collaborative for Academic Social and Emotional Learning. We've been growing rapidly as an organization. But yet here's the problem. People don't behave in an emotionally intelligent way. Raise your hand if, don't look to your left or right. <laughs> Raise your hand if you work with someone who is not very skilled at managing their feelings. Yeah, we all have, uh, imagine if you live with someone who's not very skilled and regular. Yeah. yeah, we have this argument at home a lot because I do this work obviously and in my family it's like, really? You're the director of the Center for Emotional Intelligence? <laughs> We're all human. So a big question is, you know, why emotional intelligence? Why a book called Permission to Feel? And I want to make multiple cases for all of you today. The first is the mental health case. I think if you understand the data in our society right now, you see why we have not done well for our kids. If emotional intelligence is so popular and social and emotional learning is so embedded into our nation's schools, then why? Then why, oh why, I thought I shut my phone off. Lonnie, you're gonna get mad at me now. Then why, oh why do we have a rise in anxiety disorders? Why is depression the leading cause of disability worldwide? Why has the suicide rate increased by 28% in the last 20 or so years? Why is it that a third of all kids are bullied on average in school every day? And why is it that hate crimes have been, um, have doubled in terms of their reporting in the last couple of years? It doesn't really make sense, right? If, if everybody's doing social emotional learning, and all these companies are embedding emotional intelligence into their practices, then why is this the case? Then we can take an equity case. We have obviously a huge number of students in poverty where I live. I live in Connecticut and in New York. Um, a minimum of 70% of our students in New York City are living in poverty. We know that um, trauma, as all of you would know, um, is prevalent in most of our schools. At least 10% of children have three or more. Uh, we know that there's a bias or biases uh, in regarding expulsions. Um, and we know that educator burnout is at all time highs. Um, I'll show you some of the research that I've done. We can also make the business case. Um, these are the results from a study that came out recently that corporations are saying, I'll give you an example, I was, um, while writing my book, I interviewed people who were CEOs and executives of different companies. One of them was from the Rand Corporation. And he said to me, Mark, like, we're really getting tired of all these MIT, Stanford, Yale graduates. I said, why? He said, because they know everything. But yeah, they don't get along well with people. And he goes, and they give the most boring presentations. <laughs> and he goes, and when there's conflict, it's a nightmare. Um, and the list goes on in terms of these social and emotional attributes that have not been developed. So as you can see here, the argument is that 30 to 40% of our jobs are going to require these skills, but 
only about 42% of our nation's um, applicants, they say, have these skills. And then we're going to make the larger case, the one that I'm going to focus on for the next hour or so, which is the self-awareness case. So I'm going to ask all of you to take a moment and absorb the tool that's going to change your life. Uh, this is our mood meter. And truthfully, the mood meter is the tool that um, is based in quite a lot of evidence. I call it deceptively simple because it looks deceptively simple on its surface. And you're going to see why it's going to get granular in a moment. So I'm going to ask all of you to take a moment and think about your level of pleasantness this morning. You all woke up, sort of. I mean, some of you don't look like you did yet. Um, and you are or did appraise the day. You looked at your calendar, your phone. Like I wake up in the morning, I look at my phone. Oh, shit, I got that meeting today. Um, and you looked at your phone and it said, talk, Mark Brackett. And you had a feeling about it. Some of you were like, oh, oh my goodness, I'm going to get to sit with a guy from Connecticut and talk about feelings. And others of you were like, I'm being forced to go here for my CEUs. Minus five would mean that right now, your appraisal of my presentation is negative. You're having thoughts in your head, something like, I'm wasting my time. This is the worst experience of my life. Minus three would mean, you know, it's like everyday misery. You know, I could be here with Mark, I could be with my family, I could be at school, like what's the difference? In the middle, you'd be neutral. I like to say it's like the people in Connecticut where I live. We have like, we're known as the emotionless state. We don't really talk about feelings, we don't ask about feelings. We drink. Um, maybe you're at plus three in pleasantness. You're thinking to yourself something like, oh my goodness. I'm going to get something out of this day. It's even possible you're at plus five in pleasantness. Like this is the absolute most wonderful experience of your life. You're looking at me and thinking to yourself something like, ah, I want Mark to move in. <laughs> like I want to wake up next to Mark every morning and then, I, and then I can talk about my feelings finally. So you're somewhere between minus five and plus five. Please give yourself a number. What's going on for you here? What's your self-talk? On the y-axis, it says energy. All of you have some degree of energy right now, or what we might call in psychology, activation or arousal. Minus five would mean that you're depleted of all of your resources. You're at the end of your rope. Plus five, you have so much energy you can't contain yourself. What's your body telling you right now? What's the signals? What's the messages that your body is sending out to your brain? Are you energized or are you depleted? And then we cross our two axes to create our medidor emocional. We got yellow, red, blue, and green. Yellow is high energy and pleasant. Raise your hand if you're in the yellow. Okay, it's like a little more enthusiasm would be helpful. Like, <laughs> like there's a, you know, I could use a little bit more just so you know. I know it's early. I know it's warm, but like whatever. Green. Anybody in the blue or the red? It's all right. So like people are like afraid to tell us they're unpleasant, right? It's okay. Um, I lived there probably 50% of my life. So 99% of you are in the yellow and green today. That's interesting. All right, let's take a moment and get granular. I want you to replace your color with a word. You've got three seconds to find the feeling word that best describes how you're feeling right now. Freeze. All right, now it's get, we have to get honest. Raise your hand, honestly, if you had some trouble finding the word. Hands up high, like really high. Stretch it out, high, high, high. Please reach up high. Please look around the room. So about 70% of people in the world of psychology and counseling are emotionally illiterate. <laughs> <laughs> There's hope. I'm going to ask you to take a moment and work with someone near you on becoming a scientist. All of you are now working at the Center for Emotional Intelligence and you're generating hypotheses. What are your hypotheses? Why would it be that a room filled with people with, who are highly educated, working with people, helping them to deal with their feelings, yet struggle? 
finding words. You got one minute, go to work. <clears throat> All righty, let's come back together, please. <clears throat> so who has a high, who's got a hypothesis? Yes, back there, Le in your opera voice. All right, so you're just so depleted, you're like, I don't even know how I feel anymore. <laughs> All right, it's possible. Hopefully not like too prevalent, but yes, yes. No practice. He's like, but we ask people every day that simple question: like, Hey, how's it going? How are you feeling? And what do we say? Fine, Fine. or busy? Other hypotheses. So you need more time. So you just were like, it's a new information that you're kind of putting together. Makes sense. How many words do you think you need? I have like four that came to mind, but they were not all the same five. That's all right. So four is fine. Like five is a mental illness. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got seven feelings. I'm like, ay, ay, ay. Um, but. Um, it is possible. Like, I have lots of feelings today. Like, I'm excited to present to all of you. I've got a really long day ahead of me. I've got a long week ahead of me. I've got stuff at work that I forgot about. I've got family. Like, like you've got things going on. Um, so you're, you're correct in saying that that might be the case. Any other hypotheses? Yeah. Yeah, so it's like, I'm having an odd mixture of disappointment and hopelessness. <laughs> And I feel like it might be despair, but I'm not certain. So I'm going to go into the Taurus and find, you know. So maybe that obsessive, compulsive, like, desire to be perfect. Yep. Right. Yeah, so I'm going to challenge you on that. Um, so the question was, she goes, I'm going to have to suppress. So maybe you don't have to suppress. Maybe there are other strategies that you could use to maybe deal with your feelings and not have to bury them. It's possible. Lots of different hypotheses. How many of you believe in your heart of hearts as you review your own educational experience that you had an adequate education in emotions? Maybe one person. You know, and most people, after they go through our training, they really like, oh, I didn't even know there was these things that existed. I'll give you my own life. So I've studied psychology. I've been in therapy for God knows how many years. I've spent all of my life writing curriculum on this topic. And the truth is, it wasn't until I was probably 37 that I even knew there was a thing called emotion regulation. I didn't even know there was a concept. Nor did I know there were like evidence-based strategies. I mean, I went for therapy and I, I could tell you so much about my mother. I mean, it was dynamic, let me put it that way. 
and the inferiority I had with my father, because my father was a tough guy, and he wanted him to be a tough guy, I never became a tough guy. Oy. Uh, a lot of time spent there. But I never learned words to describe my feelings, and I really never learned strategies to regulate them effectively. And that's where we're going to go now. So we're here for about an hour, and um, my hunch, well, let me just ask, how many of you during the next hour might get distracted? Raise your hand. Okay, so think about this now. We have emotionally illiterate, attention deficit disordered <laughs> people here. It's a great model. Um, as we say, you have to be the role model. <laughs> so my question for you is, when you notice yourself getting distracted, when you notice yourself saying, I gotta go to work, or I gotta suppress, or I gotta run, or I gotta go, what's your strategy, honestly, to get the most out of this hour so that you can become the best learner for the day? What's your strategy? Who feels they have a strategy? Yes. You're going to take notes. You're going to take a breath. You're going to take a breath and come back to the moment. Someone else. Just be the present. The past is gone, right? Gosh. And you're here now, and in the future, God only knows, you don't want to, you watch the news, you don't want to go there. We're going to stay here. We're going to be in the present. So we're going to breathe, we're going to be in the present. We're going to um, take notes. You're going to label it as a thought, and you come back to the present. You're going to look for what you're interested in, if anything. <laughs> Staying, you're going to stay engaged. You're going to stay excited about it. All right, you're going to stay in your body. Good place to be. It's only, the only one you got. All right, so now we're going to imagine that I am a third grade, fifth grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, twelfth grade teacher, substitute. Whew. Morning, everybody. My name is Mr. Mark, and I'm your uh, substitute science teacher today. Your teacher's away on maternity leave, so I'm going to be here with you for the next few weeks. Um, I know that your school is using this program on emotional intelligence and social and emotional learning. Really it's cool that you're doing that. And you have this tool you call the mood meter that you're all plotting yourself on and checking in with your feelings. Can I ask everyone to check in with their feelings this morning before we get started in our lesson on discovery? All right, great. So last week, I had the privilege of being around some school psychologists and counselors who were teaching me some strategies to help them regulate. So today, if you notice yourself getting distracted, what I want you to do is take notes. Just take all the notes you can, because everything I say is important. <laughs> if that doesn't work, what I want you to do is I want you to breathe. Just breathe. Just come back to the present moment and take that breath and breathe. And if that doesn't work, what I want you to do is look for the things that like excite you about this lesson. And if that doesn't work, just go into your body. It's your only body. I want you to go into it, and I want you to feel it. And then you're going to come back to the lesson on discovery. OK, are you ready to begin the day? Okay, the, f the people who shared now hate my guts. <laughs> All right, you've got one minute with your neighbor. What's up with these strategies? What works? What might not work about these strategies? Go. So what do you think about these strategies? You like them? All right, you're allowed to like them. So like, put away all the distractions, OK? Right. A lot of the strategies were about down-regulating negative emotions, weren't they? Like, kind of getting rid of the negative feeling and getting into this calm state, which is a bias we have in education, just putting it that way. We want everybody to be calm, and that way we can do our thing. 
Um, so there's something there. What else came up for people in terms of the efficacy of these strategies? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So potentially, like if I'm feeling grief because of the loss of a loved one, like I'm telling someone to like not have that feeling and go someplace so they can be a learner. But maybe it's possible to feel grief simultaneously while learning. Reminds me, by the way, I was in a school recently that has used our approach for many years. And I was observing a teacher do a lesson that just blew my mind. A simple one. It was a morning check-in. And this little boy is a very um, um, poor area in Brooklyn. And the boy shared that his pet hamster had been killed that morning um, by a rat. I mean, it was like, when you think about the lifestyle and this, this, where he's living, you can imagine how painful his life is in general. But to know that his little hamster gerbil thing got killed by a rat. Um, and he was very comfortable sharing it, which was amazing to me. Um, and um, so the teacher, who was not prepared for that, actually, um, knew that she had to do something, obviously, to support this young child. And she just said, you know, everyone, what can we do to support George today? Lo and behold, one little girl stands up and she goes, George, I got gotcha. you. She's like, you need to talk today. I'm here. Another boy stood up. He goes, hey, George, you need a hug? And it was just amazing to me to watch the kids themselves come up with the strategies that were going to be supportive of this young boy. There was never a goal to tell him not to feel his pain about his loss. Um, and what I thought was amazing to me is if, as the observer of this lesson, I watched his body language and his facial expression just completely shift. Just incredible to watch him go from this tense fear place to being at ease. And it wasn't like we were eliminating his feeling. We were just helping him be comfortable with the feelings he was having. So this acceptance piece is, is pretty important. We're going to get more into emotion regulation and the way we use it in our center. But I will say one important thing. Everyone here needs different strategies to support their emotion regulation. And unfortunately, we've come to a, a place where we like quick fixes in America. We like mindfulness and everybody breathes. And it's fine. I am a mindfulness practitioner. But I work at a university where all of my students actually say they're stressed, but they're feeling deep envy. And I know that because I study these students in a very qualitative and quantitative way. And I go to the counseling center and I say, so what's your strategy to support all the hundreds, if not thousands, about 50% of our students are seeking treatment for mental health challenges right now. What's your strategy? Oh, yoga. I'm like, I don't understand. I do yoga. I mean, I could do a lot of poses, but like, and I can like, you know. But the truth is like, when I'm doing this, like my envy is not going anywhere. <laughs> it's like, I'm even, you know, sometimes it's funny when I do my breathing exercise, I'm like, wow, I really am insecure. <laughs> so we have to be careful about these one kind of fixes. Um, and I think what's so important is that emotion management, which is at the top of the hierarchy for emotional intelligence, is an exploration throughout your life. Like some days these strategies will work, some days they won't. And unless you have a pocket full of a variety of strategies, whether they be breathing exercises, whether they be cognitive strategies, whether they be doing things like you love, like going for a run or aerobics or yoga, like you just need a lot more strategies. And I think very importantly is that we tend to be biased in terms of teaching the ones that we like the most for ourselves. And we have to be really careful about that because A, like I only like hot yoga. I like vigorous, like really tough classes with vinyasas and handstands because that's just what I need right now in my life. Some people like restorative yoga. I hate restorative yoga. I want to go to those classes that makes me angry. I have to sit there for an hour and the teacher's like, all right, now look to your left. I'm like, I'm going to lose it. Like, I don't know what to do with this class. And I go into judge mode. I'm like, who are these people that like to sit here and twist their neck for an hour? But it works for some people. 
it doesn't work for me. I like this, you don't like that, not a problem. We don't have to all choose the same strategies because the one thing that's different about this work than the traditional academic work is that there is no criterion of correctness. Everything in academia, everything in school has a criterion of correctness. The math problem has this solution. The essay has this kind of thing you have to do. Guess what? When it comes to your emotional life, there's no criterion of correctness. The only thing is it does it not do harm to you or other people. Other than that, it's an, it's an exploration of strategies that help you throughout your life. So let me share with you some research. You're probably interested in research. Here is the state of emotional affairs of our high school students in America. This is 22,000 students from all states. When we ask them in their own words, how do you feel as a student in your school? 77% of the words, negative. So we said, let's study teachers. They're doing great. <laughs> the number one emotion experienced by an educator in our nation's schools is frustration. I said, all right, let's go to college students. I had access to 12 universities across the state of Connecticut. They're doing great. Although, truthfully, there's other emotions hidden behind that stress, which we'll get into in a moment. Then we studied 15,000 people across the workforce, people who work in finance to farming. They're stressed. So when we go back to our mood meter, all of you seem to be in the yellow and green, but everybody else in the world seems to be in the left. And I think here's another thing that I'd like to just chat with you about for a moment, which is this ever-ending struggle to be happy. Um, there are more books on happiness than there are people in this room. And I have a feeling that they're doing more good or more damage than good. And why would that be the case? Well, think about it. Let me give you my own example. I'm an erotic Jewish professor. I will never be happy. <laughs> I mean, I can, I'm begging for like contentment. Can I have some light? Can I just be serene for the day? Um, and I was reading all these books on happiness, and I'm like, I'd wake up in the morning and be like, what do I got to do today to be happy? And then by 3 o'clock, I'm like, I didn't make it. And then I would get frustrated. I'm like, I'm not doing enough to be happy. And I think there's some misguidance there around what it means to be happy. And why do I say that? Because when we ask people from across the world how they want to feel, what do they say? Happy. What I think is more interesting is when you pull out happy, and you look at the other words. Because the first, we give them like multiple options. Not multiple. We said, what's your first word? What's your second one? What's your third word? Everybody says happy is the first one. I think it's because it's a, going back to the earlier exercise, people have no emotion vocabulary. So their automatic is just happy. But then you get appreciated, excited, respected, supported, satisfied, valued, accomplished. Honest raise of hands. How many of you think that life at work would be slightly better if on a daily, weekly basis you felt more appreciated by your colleagues, if you had more excitement, felt more accomplished, felt greater respect and supported and valued. Anyone? Yeah. But we tend not to focus on those feelings. We tend to focus on the happiness factor. And I want to push us to be more granular in our thinking around feelings and get away from happy and start thinking about the more specific emotions that we may need to experience more of in life. And why do we care about that? Well, there are five really important reasons. And I call this my money slide. And why do I call this my money slide? Because I get a lot of resistance, like those Yale doctors. What happened to Yale? Um, I get resistance from superintendents of schools, too. I had one just recently. He went like this, I don't think I like this approach. I'm like, I don't think I like you. It's like, we do not have to work together. Um, you can continue doing whatever, you, you know, oh, drives me out of my mind. I try to use better strategies in saying that. What I try to use is data. So there are five reasons why all of you should care about being here today. It's not because of me. It's because of the science. The first is that emotions are the drivers of our attentional capacity. How you feel right now is keeping you present. 
which, by the way, goes back to all those strategies that we were talking about earlier. And I want to make another, we have one issue, which is we're trying to be correct with our strategy. The second is that we are overly focused on self-control and impulse gratification and delay gratification. The truth is, in schools, in homes, in workplaces, emotions are mostly co-regulated. Think about that. Right now, all of your emotions are being co-regulated by my presence, whether it's pleasant for you or unpleasant for you. If I walked in like this, thanks, Lonnie, for bringing me out here. Like, I can see this is a winning group. Right? All of your brains are like, I went out. I hate this guy. He's an arrogant jerk. That's what's going to happen, because your brains are literally built to make predictions. And you're making predictions based on what you see and what you hear. That's all we got. We got senses too, but those other ones were primarily making predictions based on what we see and hear. So you're listening to my tone of voice, you're paying attention to my presentation style, you're looking at the slides, and you're saying, do I want to engage or do I want to disengage? Do I want to be present or do I want to get out of here? That's what your brains are doing automatically. Just because I'm standing right now and I'm in control means that I am by definition co-regulating how you're feeling. Does that resonate with people? But yet all day long we're like, pay attention, sit down, right? Get more grit. <laughs> it's completely misguided in terms of how the brain works. The second is decision making. Raise your hand here if you've ever made a bad choice. <laughs> all right, so you're human. Very briefly, so we do research on emotions and decision making. And interestingly enough, for educators in the room, we did a study recently where we randomly assigned teachers to be in different mood states. Think about a good day, think about a bad day, good day, 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 bad day. And then all of a sudden, we gave them all the exact same essay to grade. Anyone think there were differences in the grades? I really, of course. That's because you're here at the presentation. The participants, 87% of them denied that their feelings had any influence over the grade they assigned, even though in the end there was a one to two full grade difference. So what that tells us is that our feeling states on a daily basis are shifting the way we see the world, and in turn that is influencing the judgments we're making. But the critical thing is it's happening outside of awareness. The third reason why emotions matter is they are signals. At, the, at their core, emotions are signals to approach or avoid. Think about it. If I walk in like this, what are you looking at? Approach or avoid? I hope it's avoid, otherwise you're like really psycho. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I want to be around that guy who's smug and disgusting and, you know. No, it's an avoid expression. Closed, kind of disgusted facial expression that's saying, I'm more powerful than you, I don't respect you, stay away. Open, gentle smile says what? Approach. This is the audience participation part, by the way. <laughs> so think about that. By definition, emotions are signals. They are giving us information. How I feel on the inside is saying, go for the day, Mark. Or you know what? I predict I'm going to feel like crap today at my workplace. I'm going to call in sick or I'm going to hide under the covers. When I walk into my school or my organization or my office, I'm looking at people's facial expressions and body language and I'm making predictions. Am I welcome here or am I unwelcome here? Do I want to be here or do I not want to be here? Just the way the brain works. Fourth is physical and mental health. You're all in this profession. I think you know that we are probably in the worst place we've been in America in terms of children's psychological health. Um, the American Psychological Association, for example, has shown that today's adolescents are more stressed out than the adults who are raising them. Um, mental health problems will cost the global economy about $16 trillion over the next 20 years to just from disability to health care to uh, medicine. Finally, performance and creativity. Raise your hand if you value creativity. Raise your hand if you ever tried to be creative. Raise your hand if you like, it didn't really work out all the time. <laughs> it's hard to be creative, right? Yeah, that's what employed the number one attribute, by the way, the number one attribute 
that our Fortune 500 companies say they're looking for is divergent thinking and creativity. But yet, we teach convergent thinking constantly. It goes back to those strategies. Now, I don't know about you, but in my journey to become an emotion scientist, which is what I, a self-proclaimed person, um, I've had a lot of stumbling blocks. I mean, like, endless. I've gotten really harsh feedback in my career. I've had, for example, my first uh, wave of this work was with my uncle and we would go to schools and my job is not to talk to students about my feelings. That's what people said to us. I was in England just about, I don't know, 10 years ago and this, I was in this area of London as one head of school. She's like, we're not doing this program here. I said, why? She goes, it's going to turn the boys into homosexuals. I'm like, that is so layered that I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> like, I just don't even know where to begin with you. Um, endless, endless resistance to this work. And here's what I've learned over the last 25 years of research, is that we have co like cognitive ability and we've got emotion ability. We've got cognitive ability and we've got emotion abilities. You can have all the cognition in the world, but if you don't have the emotion skills to deal with life, the frustration during your journey, the disappointment on your journey, the negative feedback on your journey, other people's opinions about your work on your journey, guess what? You don't achieve your dreams. So we put so much emphasis in the cognitive domain when we don't realize that the emotion skills that we are not teaching our kids is what's holding them back from achieving their dreams. Just take a moment and think about that. How many smart kids you've met who just haven't been successful because they don't know how to deal with their feelings. So the question is, what are the skills? And we call them emotional intelligence. And in my book that many of you are going to get a copy of, there's a chapter on each one of these skills. It's the first time I've had the opportunity in my career to like flesh out all of these skills in a way that I feel is the most meaningful. The first one is recognizing emotions. Being highly aware of your own and others' emotions. Am I emotion, am I perceptive? Am I aware of what's going on for me in my brain and body? Or am I not making meaning out of it? The second is understanding emotion. Understanding the cause and the consequences. And the third is labeling, having the word. So I'm gonna test you on your emotional intelligence right now. Two emotions that we all know a lot about, anger, and disappointment. Raise your hand if you've heard of those terms before. <laughs> okay, you've got one minute with your colleagues to differentiate those two for me psychologically speaking. What is the underlying psychological difference between anger and disappointment? Go to work. Let's come back together. So who's confident? Who's going to step out of their comfort zone and say, I know the difference between anger and disappointment? All right, so this is really interesting to me. I don't have words to describe my feelings. I got attention problems. And I'm a clinician who doesn't know the difference between anger and disappointment. Lonnie, I'm coming back. All right, who's confident? Yes. You can be whoever you are. All right, thank you. Yes. All right. Okay. Disappointed, you accept the outcome and and anger, you've resigned. All right, let's stop there. We're done. I'm going home. How many of you feel confident that you're going to get on Twitter or Facebook or whatever you use for social media if you do and say, I just learned the difference between anger and disappointment. Here's what it is. Or how many of you are like, I'm not really sure now. All right, let's try an action one. So I am your patient. I'm your client. I'm your son. I am 13 years old and I am going to karate to be a tough guy because that's what my father wanted me to do when I was being bullied horrifically. My mother said, oh 
oh my god, honey, you're being bullied here. But don't worry, your mother loves you. I'm like, your love is not helping me in the bathroom, mama. Uh, and like, my dad was like, son, I want you to toughen up. As you can see, <laughs> I did a good job. So anyhow, I now get dropped off at martial arts studio to get, you know, and I'm so eager, I'm gonna get a yellow belt. So I push my sensei to get my yellow belt test. I'm gonna take the yellow belt, take the yellow belt. I go to take the test. I come home from karate. I hate karate. I'm never going back to karate again. I failed my yellow belt test. I'm a loser. I hate you for making me go to karate. How am I feeling? All right, so who knows, how, who's gonna tell me how I'm feeling? Now we're getting there. So here's a big important message. Behavior has nothing to do with feeling. Scenario one, I go to take the test with my sensei and I have to do the blocks. And I, everything goes like kicks go well, punches go well. And then the sensei says, but Mark, your blocks, are, you know, you weren't, you really didn't back them up enough. You gotta take the test over again and get those blocks down. How am I feeling? I'm disappointed. I expected to pass. Everything was legit, but I failed. That's a disappointment, unmet expectations. All right, next scenario. I go to take the test, and my sensei goes, but you can't take the test with your best friend right before the test is starting. What do you mean? I've been practicing with Mike the whole time. I understand this. Why? That, that's not fair. How am I feeling? I'm pissed. I'm angry. That's not fair. You didn't warn me. You didn't tell me that. You should have told me that. That's not fair. Because anger is about perceived injustice. Scenario three, I fail the test legitimately, but in the locker room, a kid who's a bully in the school comes up to me and says, we knew you were going to fail that test, you wimp. Wait till you see what it's like for you tomorrow on the way to school. Now how do I feel? Shame and fear. All of those are possible scenarios. All of them present themselves, I hate you. I'm not going back to school tomorrow. And what happened in my family was my mother, who was very anxious and overly reactive and easily triggered, who do you think you are talking to me the way? Get to your room. Wait till your father gets home. <laughs> Can't wait for daddy to get home. <laughs> right? And daddy. Come upstairs to my room, son, if I have to tell you one more time, if you touch your mother that way one more time. And then my parents would get into a fight because my mother would be like, Billy, but that's not the way to handle it. And then my father, but Diana, I can't take it anymore. And, bah, 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 bah. and then my father would go downstairs and then my mother would come in because she had some of that lovely passive aggressiveness. And she'd say, you know something, Mark? I saved you this time. Save me from what is the question? <laughs> so, you know, now you know why I'm running around the world trying to get people to learn strategies to regulate. <laughs> this microphone is having fun. But think about that. Do you see how I was, the true scenario for me was I was feeling shame. I hated myself. I had such low self-esteem. I had low self-worth because I was bullied and made fun of. I'm trying to go to karate to be, to be tough. I fail my freaking yellow belt test. I get humiliated at the class for doing it. And I'm coming home and I'm like, don't know how to, I've never, I didn't have an opportunity to talk about my feelings because they weren't really open to feelings. I'm screaming, I'm yelling basically for help, but I got punished for it because my parents didn't have the skills to deal with my triggering them. They weren't able to be the role models. They just didn't know what they didn't know. They didn't have an emotion education. I'm gonna ask you to now think about the adults who you work with in your schools. How many of them do you believe are nuanced in terms of that granularity of emotion? Disappointment is about unmet expectations. Anger is about injustice. Fear is about impending danger. Shame is about negative self-worth. How many think really understand that? And when they're working with kids and the kids are sharing their stories, they're making meaning out of that to help guide them to an effective strategy to help them regulate. Now you look hopeless. <laughs> this is hard work. 
And this means that the adults who are raising and teaching kids have to be the work. And what drives me out of my mind in the field of social and emotional learning, of which I'm a major part, is that we buy these kits to throw at schools. Here's your kit. Friday feelings days and Thursdays about conflict and Wednesdays about empathy. When you really have to see that doing this work is so much deeper, right? It's about how leaders lead, how teachers teach, how students learn, and how families parent. So that leads us to the last two skills of expressing and regulating emotion. <clears throat> the first three skills, just for your information, are all about making meaning of your own and other people's emotions. Someone's trying to take over. The first. <laughs> all right. Everyone breathe. <laughs> <laughs> so, we'll be all right. I can handle it. Let's shut the doors and get it even hotter. Um, first three skills, making meaning of our own and other people's emotions. The E and the R is what we do with those feelings. So, big question is, do I have the permission to express my feelings? That's a big question for you. In your workplace, do you have permission to express how you really feel? Do you have a leader who's open to hearing how you really feel? Do the kids in your school feel they have the permission to express every emotion that they're experiencing? And I don't think we can take this lightly. Because I will give you a very personal example, and I wrote about this for the first time in my book. As a kid, I was pretty horrifically abused by a neighbor. And I was silenced by that adult. That adult basically threatened me to not share what I was going through for many, many years. And guess what? Those feelings were suppressed. They were repressed. They were eaten. They were, I mean, I can't tell you all the unhealthy things I did. And when I went to share them with my parents, not what had happened because I was threatened, I couldn't do that. So I had to hold my feelings inside, and we know what that does to us. Older, when I got older, um, one thing I didn't share was that I was on te public television trying to advocate for children who were being abused to speak up. But I was 11 years old. And what happened is that the entire neighborhood that I worked, lived in turned against our family because we had outed the abuser, and we also had outed other families who weren't ready to disclose what had happened. So now I became the pariah, and then I got bullied. So you can imagine what it's like for a kid who's been abused and bullied and has no adults with whom he could talk about his feelings. It's a horror show. And I wonder, like, why was I a failing student? Right? Obviously, I'm brilliant. I mean, let's get real here. That was a joke, by the way. But my cognition was not able to be used because my emotion system was so all over the place. I didn't have anyone teach me strategies except for one person. And he happened to be the person I dedicated my book to, which is my Uncle Marvin. Now, Uncle Marvin was my mother's brother. He was a middle school teacher by day, and he was a band leader at the hotels in the Catskill Mountains by night. And what was interesting about Uncle Marvin was he did one thing that no other adult had ever done with me. He actually would stay at our house on the weekends because he was getting a master's degree. And he'd, we'd sit in the backyard and he'd just say, hey, Mark, like, how's it going? How are you feeling? But somehow or another, his facial expression, his body language, his vocal tone just gave me the permission to let it all out. And I let him know everything that was going on for me, all the pain, all the fear, all the stress, all the anxiety, all the self-denigration. And he didn't say, so son, what are you gonna do about it? Toughen up, or don't tell me, I'll have a breakdown, which is what I heard from my parents. What he said was, what do you need? What can I do to support you? And I will tell you that that was that moment in my life where things started turning around, where there was an adult who show they cared, or there was an adult who gave me the permission to feel. Now, when I got older, I decided to go into this field of social and emotional learning and emotional intelligence. And my uncle was retired, and I pulled him out of retirement. 
And I said, Uncle Marvin, we're going to change the world together. And he was like the Robin Williams character in Dead Poet Society. Like he was a really cool guy, had the beard, and it was really like an entertainer. Um, and we failed. And we failed because Uncle Marvin and I, well, first of all, he was like 67 at the time. I was 23. Like it's a, a roadshow not made to happen. <laughs> and we wrote this book about how to teach emotional intelligence in middle school. <clears throat> And I share this with you because we try to get people to do the work and we just were up against so many resistances, endless resistance from I'm not going to talk about my feelings to I'm not comfortable with the negative emotions to we're going to do this after the state tests. And what I realized very quickly in my career was this had nothing to do with kids. That all we, everything we do in PD is about a new math curriculum, a new science curriculum that we teach teachers to do. And what we fail to realize, what this is all about, is getting the adults to be emotion scientists. To be curious about emotions. To be in the learner mode. To be reflective and inquisitive. To be open to exploring strategies and have that growth mindset. Like, Mark, it's tough now, but guess what? It doesn't have to be that way. You don't have any strategies right now, Mark, but guess what? We're going to teach you some strategies. Versus the emotion judge, who is very close to feelings, who is in knower mode constantly, who is generally telling people, why are you so angry? That's what my mother, why are you so angry? I'm not angry, I'm feeling shame. You just don't know how to ask the questions to get to the deep inside feeling. And has more of a fixed mindset around these feelings and skills. So I've been with people saying, Mark, this is who I am, get over it. That's a fixed mindset about your ability to learn these skills and strategies. So then the question is, what's the theory? And of course, we got lots of theories. As a matter of fact, the reason why I have a career is because of a theory. So you've got to learn the feelings. You've got to get granular about those feelings. You've got to give permission to have the expression of those feelings. You've got to learn how to regulate those feelings. I'll give you one example. So I have two older brothers. They're both in the medical field. We're blown away, like, where did we come from? <clears throat> but my brothers came to hear me speak about a year ago. Um, they were seven and 11 years apart. So they, don't, they think I just make money by thinking in coffee shops. And uh, anyhow, so it's a New York City hotel. It's a big room like this. And I'm doing my shtick, and I'm talking about my childhood. I'm talking about my parents. And I see my the first 15 minutes, my brother's like, oh, that's my brother. 25 minutes in, I see my mom like, like literally having like a conniption about my presentation. So I run off the stage. At the end of my talk, I'm like, guys, what do you think? And my one brother looks at me, and he goes, you shamed our family. I'm like, oi, you know, what do you mean? He's like, you talk way too much. You, you, what are you doing? You shouldn't be sharing all this about mommy and daddy. You shouldn't be sharing this all. And my one brother looked at me and he goes, and you know want something, Mark? People are going to think you're weak. And I was like, Dave, I just want to let you know. In my department, we call that projection. <laughs> like, like, I'm doing OK. And maybe if you talked a little bit more about your feelings, you'd be a little healthier. I didn't say that, but I wanted to. <laughs> Which goes back into the strategies again. Once we express, we have to say, well, am I going to keep this feeling or am I going to shift this feeling? What are my strategies? What I've learned in my career is that we use a lot of unhealthy ones. Can't tell you how many people just tell me all these unhealthy strategies. One teacher told me recently, I put my feelings in a box before I enter my school. Now going back to some of the strategies you shared earlier, I'm going to give you a scenario. Recently, I was in a preschool in New York City. Happened to be a morning where a parents were going through a divorce and the father walked into the four-year-old's bedroom and said the following, your mother loves somebody else and you're going to have a new daddy. And the guy left for work and now the mother is with this child bringing him to school. The kids having a complete breakdown. So should I tell this child 
just look for what's exciting today in the curriculum <laughs> or take your breath or just be in the present moment, right? Think about that, right? Or maybe you should just put your feelings in a box. Do you see how we have so much work to do in terms of helping people to really regulate their feelings effectively, right? Because that boy needs a lot more than just someone telling them how to regulate, right? They need unconditional support. They need someone who can assuage their feelings. I'm gonna wrap up by saying there's a number of things that you could do. I call these the big seven. And breathing is on top. So for those of you who are angry with me for making fun of the breath, please don't be. I've been breathing since I was born and I'll breathe until I die. And so will you. And when we're highly activated, we need the breath to deactivate. But you also gotta sleep right, you gotta eat right, you gotta move. Because while those are not directly strategies, they influence your emotion system in ways that either help you to regulate effectively or not. You gotta have relationships. Only a third of our nation's youth believe they have an adult in their school with whom they can interact. That's crazy. That doesn't make any sense. You have to pay for that. You gotta know how to have positive self-talk. So another example I will share with you. I have a niece who is adopted from Guatemala. She is the most amazing kid. And she, uh, her mom is a white woman with red hair. And I uh, had the privilege of going to Guatemala to help adopt her because I speak Spanish. Anyhow, Esme is four years old and in a very white neighborhood in upstate New York, and she got bullied horrifically because of the color of her skin. Some other kindergartner said to her, you're a different color than your mother. Ew. Now, what I can tell you about that moment was that it changed Esme's life forever. How many seconds was that? You're a different color than your mother. Ew. Five seconds, three seconds. Her negative self-talk skyrocketed. Why am I a different color? Why is Uncle Mark a different color? Um, you know, I, why am I adopted? Who am I? Why am I in this neighborhood? I mean, endless negative self-talk. Now her mom, who I know very well, who I would not categorize as being like super high in emotional intelligence, said to me, Mark, she called me up. She was like, I don't know what to do about this. I'm freaking out and I'm getting in my car and I'm running over the kid and her mother. <laughs> I got better strategies for you. So road trip up to upstate New York. And I wanna tell you this because it was so much work to help Esme shift her negative self-talk. She had to realize that she has another uncle who is dark. She had to realize that it's beautiful to be different. She had to realize that um, that young woman, five-year-old young girl, doesn't have power over her reality. Now, if she were me, a 50-year-old PhD in psychology and an expert in emotional intelligence, she would say something, who do you think you are to define my reality? Who do you think you are to speak that way? Who do you think you are, you potential racist? But she's five, right? She doesn't have that metacognitive ability. So my point is, again, that as adults, we need to be mindful of ensuring that every kid has these strategies. Because I can tell you right now, it was a tremendous amount of work to support Esme during those first few years after this happened. When she was eight, she wanted to be in the school play. She's like, she was very extroverted. And she's like, I want to be an actress. I want to be in the school play. Not a problem. She, but then all of her memories came back. But am I going to be made fun of? And is this going to happen to me? And she had a little bit of a speech thing. Am I going to people make fun of me because of my speech? So we had to work with her on her strategies there. Now I tell you this because it wasn't my job to tell her how to regulate. What her mother and I did to help her was we said, let's think about all the different things that you could say and do to support you when those negative feelings come up. And it was amazing how creative little Esme was. She had all these little sayings that she could say to herself to help her with her feelings. The day of the play, of course, I go up to see it. She's obviously fabulous. She wrote, Uncle Mark, I use my strategies. And I was like, Ez, which one did you choose? She goes, well, right before I went on the stage, I got that feeling in my stomach and I felt, I was getting really nervous. And I took my breath and I said, Esme, face your fears. <laughs> and then she went out and did her thing. <clears throat> now, why do I share that? It wasn't until I had disclosed my abuse. It wasn't until I was a teenager. It wasn't until I had my uncle sitting with me in my backyard that I just began to learn that there were strategies to deal with my feelings. And I'm envious, actually, of kids who go through our training now because 
the privilege for them to learn these things and grow those strategies over time is just mind blowing to I me. And I've witnessed it because I've now worked with schools for 10 and 15 years and I just see the way these kids operate and their brains are just completely different in terms of the way they process feelings and in terms of the way they regulate feelings. So there are a lot of things you can do. You could take a meta moment, which is one of our other strategies, which is helping you see your best self. So when you're triggered, you say, wait, I can take this meta moment. I can be my best self. It's very interesting because I'm very easily triggered. I have a high kind of trigger reflex, especially because I grew up very blue collar and I work at an institution that's not like that. And I, Professor Brecker, I've got a question, but I'm not really sure the answer. I'm thinking like, who taught you how to use your chin that way? <laughs> you know, like, really? And I always think to myself, I may not know the answer, but I'm gonna grade your freaking paper. <laughs> um, and the question is, in that moment, how do I activate my best self? How do I pause and not the boom, you entitled blank, which is my gut feeling. But Mark, wait a minute. You're the director of the Center for Emotional Intelligence. <laughs> yeah, use your strategies. I'm going to wrap up and then take a few questions with all of you. We know that people in your positions who have these skills are healthier and happier. We know that working in a school with a leader who is higher in emotional intelligence is an advantage. So it's not only about the teachers, it's about the leaders. Look at the difference in the way people say they feel. Inspiration, 50% higher. Frustration, 50% lower on a daily basis at work. Burnout, fear of speaking up when there's a problem. Engagement, purpose and meaning. The list goes on. We have tools, one that you can read about in the book called a Mood Meter app that can help you build awareness over time. You actually can share it and share it. Get, so if you're a clinician, you can actually share it confidentially with clients to and help work with them to track their feelings, to track your own feelings. Let's wrap up. One, you gotta give yourself and everyone around you the permission to feel. You just do. It starts with that. The second is you have to recognize that emotions are information. <clears throat> All emotions are information. It's my anger about our education system that keeps me motivated to do my work. It's my anger when I see other people hurt other people and bully them that motivates me to help them out. Empathy does not drive action. Anger oftentimes drives action over empathy. Third, we have to work towards being emotion scientists and not emotion judges. I think importantly, we have to appreciate that these skills are real skills. Oftentimes they're classified as soft skills. I think you can see today, these are actually harder than the hard skills to learn and develop. Importantly, you should know that it's never too early or too late to develop these skills. A few basic tips, A, to avoid that influence of emotions on decision making in ways that you don't want it to. You gotta take that breath you gotta check in with how you're feeling. Because what we know from the research is that the mediator, or I should say the moderator, of how we feel in our judgments, or the influence, is just being self-aware. Think about that. You could be angry, you could be sad, and make a good choice. You just have to be aware of why you're angry or sad. Once you make the attribution, it no longer has the bias. Finally, I can't do this alone. I hate being alone. Well, I actually am an introvert who doesn't really like people, but that's a whole other story for another day. Um, that was a joke, sort of. Um, doing this work is draining, as you can imagine, because uh, I do like to sit in coffee shops and think. Um, I don't believe this is a magic pill. I don't think there is a magic pill. I think this is about our nation's education system, our homes, our schools, our workplaces, making a real genuine commitment to the healthy emotional development of children and adults. And we have to move away from piecemeal approaches. We just have to. The, the feeling of the week, or you know, feelings Fridays, or the kit that you go in as a counselor and on one hour for one day a week, you do this little work with kids. Is it bad? No. Is it gonna develop the skills that I've talked about in a comprehensive way? Absolutely not. 
It's got to be infused into the way leaders lead, teachers teach, students learn, and families parent. There are four things I'll leave you with. One, we've got to work on those mindsets. Two, we've got to work on those skills. And guess what? You're going to have to work on those skills for your whole life. Three, it's never about the individual. It's always about the community. When I was a kid, my parents, while they could not help me, <clears throat> they did put me into therapy. But then I got dropped back into a toxic school. I got dropped back into a very dysfunctional family life. So I just did, I couldn't do anything. You need the community support. Everyone's got to be on the bus. And then finally, in our schools and in our nation, we've got to have the policies and the practices to make sure this is permanent. Here in, in Illinois, I think we've made great progress. Um, but a lot of this is unfunded, right? We've got to figure out ways to secure funds for all schools to have systems to support this work for all kids. So I'm going to end by asking you to take a nice long inhale. <sighs> I know it's hot in here, but hopefully it was worth it. And maybe just take a second to visualize your school community, your workplace community, where all children have the permission to feel. Where all kids and all adults are learning the skills of recognizing, understanding, labeling, expressing, and regulating emotion. What's different? So like I said, there is no magic pill. My hope is that today is a small step in your own emotion education and in helping you to think about how to bring this work to your schools to make a difference in all children's lives. I can tell you that it's what's given me the permission uh, to achieve my dreams. Thank you so much. Yes, back there. I, we go to room for Michael. Yes, please. You can stand up. Good. While we're waiting for the question, I just want to let you know that this is where you should go for information uh, very quickly. Uh, that my own website is information about the book, which a lot of you are getting, but also um, I've started a new blog called The Emotion Scientist, which will, uh, who I started last week. We've got thousands of people who sign up for it. It will be a bi-weekly or bi uh, every two weeks you'll get this um, kind of research kind of summary of what's happening in the field, but also reflective things that you could do with yourself and family and patients and colleagues. Um, yes. Hi there. Um, I have a lot of clients who, starting out in therapy, they see all of it as fluff. And we know we, they need to get there, but whether it's because of trauma or a lack of somatic sense or spirituality or whatever the case is, they just can't make those steps into even starting to name things and even to look at yeah. that chart. So I'm wondering so what some of the first steps would be that you'd suggest. You know, I think the app is really helpful. Um, you know, you can assign, act, what's nice about the app is that you can have people set reminders to do it three or four or five times a day for a week, and then they can send you the report and you can look at that report to see where they've been living emotionally across the week. Um, and I think that some people are, you know, emotion phobic. And what you have to do is just use the data that I shared with you today, even on the five reasons why emotions matter. It's hard for people to ignore the fact that how they feel is driving their attention, their decisions, their relationships, their health, and their performance. And I just come back to that again and again. And I say, I recognize that maybe your background has made you unfamiliar with this work, but here's what the research shows. So just try it out. Let's just work with it. Maureen, anybody on your There's side? one over here. Okay. Could you stand up, sir? Yeah. Hello. Hello. This is on. Thank you. Um, I understand as an adult that labeling emotions as positive and negative is helpful to discuss things. Yes, that I'm although I with. prefer to get rid of those labels, negative exactly. and positive. So I want to know, if, is, it, is it necessary to label emotions and could it be detrimental to kind of sharing this information with smaller children and things yeah. like that? I think the weight around it, because I don't think because of the long history of research and emotion, we're going to get rid of like a negative emotion or a positive emotions. But I think what you can do is say negative emotions provide as much information as positive emotions, and there's no such thing as a bad emotion. And I just always come back to that. I use pleasant and unpleasant, because it is unpleasant to feel you know, despair or sadness. It's not 
pleasant. It doesn't mean it's bad, and it means there's a signal that I need some support. Okay, who else, anybody here? Okay, could you stand up and walk towards me maybe? We'll make it fast. I'm watching the clock. I guess you're not gonna walk towards me. <laughs> Uh, I just want to say this is our third year using the uh, ruler frame and the mood meter is is just brilliant and is one of the most powerful tools that I use with clients and students in the school in Thank terms you. of having students be able to come. They fly off my sofa, they look at the mood meter, they label their emotion and that sense of relief that they get, and then the sense of relief that they have when I can sit with them in that emotion and decide what they want to do with it. It's just, it's so powerful, and as you say, it's so simple, and yet Thank it's, you. it's really wonderful. Thank I think you, what Mark. I want to add um, is that our emotional lives are complex, as all of you have now seen and know. And I think that what's lovely about this tool is that it can take everything that's going inside of your head and body and just give you a place to put it. And just say, am I in the yellow right now? Am I in the red? Am I in the blue? And then you ask the question for the you, which is, why am I feeling that way? Oh, I just got bad news. Oh, I'm about to take a test. So how am I feeling? And those RUL skills are really, they come together to help you identify and make meaning out of your life. And then the question is, can I express? How do I express? Who do I communicate it with? What's my strategy to shift or stay? Because we're not always regulating out. Sometimes we're regulating to just maintain. Yes. There was another question? Okay, right no, here. Here. last question though, Mark, because we got to go. <laughs> How does that make you feel? Um, th <laughs> thank you so much. That was amazing. Appreciate that. Um, the two <laughs> words that came to my mind early on when you were having doing exercises were connection and engagement and just taking the time to connect with each other and then you talked about co-creating after that yeah so i guess my question is in the past um, i've been involved in a group called matrix leadership which is about this and people are taking it into classrooms and when we found that we were trying to take it into the schools, some educators are doing it but people always talk about time yeah like oh we don't have time for that so can you comment on yeah, how we sure. work with that because that's really an interesting i mean i think our friends who are doing this can actually attest to the fact that there's more time on task when you have ch children check in with how they're feeling and have strategies to regulate. Most teachers complain about classroom management and getting students ready for learning. Well, if you have a basic practice of checking in, doing that breathing exercise and plotting yourself, it gives a way to really take everything that's going on at home, at school, in the playground, and just funnel it into that feeling state. And actually, you can get started faster with the learning process. Also, very importantly, the reason why we train adults first is that because me, I, as a teacher, have to set the emotional climate for my classroom. So I decide, you know what, we're going to be doing a read aloud today. I really want my students in the green. What's my strategy for creating that feeling? Or, you know, we're going to be brainstorming for a new paper topic. It's high school. We're going to put on some loud music. We're going to get kids up out of their seats and like doing movement so that they're in that brainstorming phase. Oh, you know, what? we're doing some peer editing right now. Low energy, slightly unpleasant because I know that we have a more narrowed focus. Or we're going to write an essay to our senator about X, Y, or Z to be persuasive. I want my students in that red quadrant right now. And what I'll say about this, which is really interesting to me as an educator, is that we are biased based on our own backgrounds and our own traits. Like, I like green because I like calm. Like, for me, the last thing I'm going to do tonight after this whole thing is I go to a sports bar. You want to see someone have a complete meltdown? It's Mark Brackett sitting at a bar drinking a beer watching a TV show of sports. No offense to anybody here, but like I can't deal with the stimuli. It just drives me out of my mind. Like I'm gonna like secretly find a yoga studio and like maybe do restorative yoga today. Uh, but um, my point is that as educators and as parents, we have to be mindful of how the emotion system works and then weave it into our curriculum. It's like magic. I will share one last thing, and I know Lonnie's going to make me want to go, but I'm on stage. Um, <laughs> I can is, be there very quickly. No, I know. She'll drag me off. <laughs> I, had, I was doing a talk in Westchester, New York, just two, three days ago, last week. And I, was, I had people do a reflection on, like, who was your Uncle Marvin? And it's very powerful to think about that. But the most miraculous thing happened to me. 
a person who was the superintendent of a local district said to me, well, Mark, your Uncle Marvin was my Uncle Marvin. And he happened to be a student of my uncle's 42 years ago. And the way this gentleman described his emotional experience in my uncle's classroom blew my mind. So much so that I was like, you're not going anywhere, I'm interviewing you. And the way he spoke about how my uncle had lines out of his door out of, to, to greet kids and how it was about like telling stories back to history, telling stories back to history, weaving in feelings back to history. And it just goes to show you, you know, that, and what he said was like, everyone else, it was a very, he lived in a very poor area, object poverty. He said every other teacher was like, sit down, you know, pay attention, where this class was different. And for him to remember the details that he shared with me, 42 years later, remember those are the memories of a 12 year old. It just blew my mind. And so what am I gonna say to end? Well, if I had glitter in my pocket, I would be like, I give you permission to feel, and I give you permission to feel. Um, and the truth is, I do think the world would be a better place when all children do have that permission to feel. Thank you for your time.